All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Matthias Bayer, and I'm a professor of pastoral theology and mental health counseling at Christian Theological Seminary. I'm also a fully trained psychoanalyst, uh, but I'm a mental health counselor in Indiana. I straddle both worlds, psychoanalysis and counseling, and I think they have a lot in common. Um, I am going to lead you through a tour de force of trying to understand from my perspective what spirituality is really about and how, my, how it has a lot to do with becoming persons. You are familiar with Carl Rogers talking about becoming persons, but there is a long history in humanity of becoming persons. And the development of spirituality or of religion originally is very much intertwined with becoming persons. That's part of the argument here. The talk that I'm giving is um, assessment of spirituality in terms of personality patterns and existential analysis. And uh, if you want to get a copy of my slides, you can get the QR code here. And uh, under that QR code, you have the presentation, you have an article that I wrote in 2007 that gives case examples, more case examples of what I'm doing here today, uh, including the case of Rosa that I'll be talking about. And it gives you uh, a draft of an assessment of spirituality in terms of personality that I'm working on. And I've been using that in my teaching. I teach uh, mental health counseling master students that are preparing for licensure in Indiana. And what we're specializing in is to be attuned to spiritual issues and religious issues, never imposing anything, but if patients are talking about it, if clients are talking about it, uh, we are qualified to assess the health or unhealth of how they're using their spirituality, because spirituality is a buzzword and it almost feels like, you know, uh, if you use spirituality, it's like good. It's not just that simple. Um, so first, I want to connect with uh, how spirituality has been defined in the counseling and psychotherapy world. So uh, Kenneth Pergamon is probably the most well-known in the counseling world uh, with his um, books and, uh, on religious coping and also his spiritually integrated psychotherapy. And he helps us understand uh, what's unique about spirituality. It's very important that we understand what's unique about spirituality as opposed to just psychology. So spirituality deals with... Uh, uh, things that have to do with our human finitude or the ultimate rela reality of one's lack of control over the events in one's life and over death itself. Uh, and spirituality is aimed to help people deal with finitude, basically. Maloney, who is quoted by uh, Pergamon, talks about ultimate anxieties of knowing one will die, feeling alienated and alone, and of experiencing powerlessness, uh, and that these can be assuaged uh, with spirituality. Uh, and he uses the word answers, which are metaphysical and supernatural. When you get to the word metaphysical, be careful because the metaphysical often is used in a Greek-like fashion as a substance. So for instance, Christianity and the Judeo-Christian tradition has a lot from Greek philosophy, where we think of things in terms of substances. And all of Christian theology is basically uh, wrapped around this philosophy of substances. And uh, really, originally, Jewish theology is not at all concerned about substances. It's about relationality. And so we're actually going to go into uh, connecting spirituality with relationality. Personhood is relational. So uh, these are um, 
definitions. And so one of my questions is what happens if a metaphysical or supernatural becomes itself the source of anxiety, um, which we often see when people have religious neurosis or, uh, or have church hurt or whatever, right? Uh, we see that the metaphysical, the talk about the ultimate has been used against them. And that is a very terrible thing that can happen. I, I uh, um, United Methodist and John Wesley at some point uh, uh, talked about, uh, talked toward people he was criticizing and he was saying, you know, you show people the way to God, but then you basically use God against them. And then you have filled the placeholder of the divine with you. That's a big problem. The conflation of human leaders and you people in power with the divine is a very big problem in spirituality or religion. And I personally believe that the backlash against religion that started primarily in the 50s, 60s, 70s has a lot to do with this conflation of human with the divine or of the finite being reduced uh, the divine being reduced to finite things that then can be controlled. And people today don't want that anymore. And your morality was used very much to that end. You know, you want to be good, behaving good, and then the behaving good is turned into, well, if you behave good, then you are good. That conflation of doing and being is also very problematic. So uh, Kenneth Pergament uh, gave us a very important distinction in terms of that when we talk about the sacred or spirituality, uh, that we have to distinguish between a substantive perspective. He uses it differently than Greek, mytho Greek uh, philosophy uh, in terms of ends and destinations. So sort of the object, what are we aiming for, right? And uh, the functional perspective, uh, what pathways we use to get there, right? So we want security, for instance, and we, we seek it in the sacred, or we want comfort. What are we using for that? And he, uh, in his spiritually integrated psychotherapy, he gives great examples of what would be uh, not integrated spiritually and what would be integrated spiritually. Like if you are getting diagnosed with heart disease and you use spirituality and say, okay, I'm gonna just pray that God will help my heart. And you don't follow any instructions the doctor gives you, he would say, that's a misuse of spirituality. That's not spiritually integrated. If someone instead says, oh, I got this diagnosis and I'm gonna uh, pray that God gives me the strength to get through this. I'm gonna connect with my community and so on uh, and uses spirituality in that way, that might help them, right? Gonna help you know, that God will help me to do exercise when I feel lazy or whatever, right? Uh, things like that. So, so the substantive uh, destinations and the functional perspective are important. Now, what I want to suggest is that this leaves out an important part. It leaves out the existential perspective, the who we are, because we're not just aiming for things, and we're not just finding ways to get there. We are somebody. The Black Lives Matter movement, the uh, anti-colonial movements are all about, hey, I'm somebody. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. somebodiness is about, I am somebody even though you can't do anything with me. I don't want you to use me. I don't want you to use me functionally. And I also don't want you to just have me focus on some object outside. I am somebody. In the Jewish tradition, there's the I am who I am, right? Or I am who I will be, uh, which is a very existential definition of God, actually, of the divine. Now, uh, so it's not an, uh, aiming at an object. It's not just the utility and function. And so what I want to emphasize here is that there's something in us that characterizes us that makes us as human spiritual. There's something in us, there's something in you that makes you spiritual as a person. And the second thing is, this is 
coming in different flavors, different personal styles. And the third thing that's important, this is not just like you take the Myers-Briggs uh, or uh, the things that come out of these 16 personality types uh, and you think, oh, that's who I am. Who you are is not just some four letter acronym. It's a relational dynamic. If you're extrovert, you're extrovert for a reason in relation to somebody. If you're introvert, you're introvert for re reason in a certain way. You're sometimes extrovert and sometimes introvert because you relate to people in certain ways. Uh, so uh, who we are as specific personalities is very important. Uh, now, what, what Pergamon said, you know, I told you I'm a psychoanalyst as well, and you know, lots has happened since Freud. But interestingly, Freud had something right about the nature of religion. He very similarly basically talked about finitude. We have religion, we have spirituality because we're dealing with helplessness, uh, we're afraid of nature, we're uh, afraid of the cruelty of fate. You know, you can step out to not to today at some point and be driven over by a car and be dead, right? I'm not saying that that will happen to you, but just to uh, get what terror management theory that comes out of Ernest Becker calls uh, mortality salience. What I just planted in you will make you a little bit more afraid today, unconsciously. Not that you really necessarily feel that, but. Uh, so hopefully that won't happen to any of us. Uh, um, it compensates for privations that civilization imposes us. And Freud talked mostly about civilization and its impact. So civilization and its discontents. Now what all of these have in common is they're all dealing basically with human finitude. So Freud was onto something in civilization and its discontents and in the future of an illusion. Uh, but what Freud thought that this is also relational, but he thought it's connected to the parental figures because we first experience something bigger than us in our parents or our caregivers. And so he thought that the whole thing about religion is about protection, that we're seeking religion because we want to be protected in this big universe that is threatening. Um, and so, you know, if you go on Netflix or Prime Video or all the other shows, there are lots of shows that will help you be in touch with your mortality, uh, uh, make you feel scared, right? And you might like that on some level and sort of uh, try to conquer it every time, right? Conquer your fear. And we as counselors help people conquer fear as well. Now, I want to go a little step deeper here because the historical origin goes really before our recorded history. And so anthropology, paleoanthropology, has a lot to say about the origin of religion, the origin specifically of the idea of God, which came out of ancestor cult originally, fertility cult, there was war, that is one of the sources. But one of the most fascinating sources of religion and of faith in a higher power has to do with burial rites, burial rites. And so between death and love is really uh, where the emergence of spirituality comes up, where we have uh, in cave paintings, uh, birds that we now associated, associate with uh, the soul flying up to heaven, right? These are early pre-recorded pre history, pre-verbal pre history. Uh, now, these burial rites, first evidence, we uh, actually, first burials, we have uh, evidence in Spain, 300,000. There has been just a finding in, I think, South Africa that uh, National Geographic just brought out that may even go further back. So, um, uh, but the first burial rites, actually, as a right, uh, are uh, found in uh, 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 Hefza, uh, Israel, and there is red ochre that's being used in a rit ritual fashion. So scientists, uh, this was a, a burial of a mother child, and uh, scientists think that the red ochre signified that they thought they were not dead because 
the redness is about blood and that on some level they were starting to believe we are not just dead when we're dead, right? We're not just gone forever. Um, and so um, there is an emerging hope for life after death or for, for that death is not the end, let's put it that way, right? That, that the loving relationship that we, we started experiencing, the attachment, if you will, uh, was thought to be more precious than what death could destroy. And if you think of spiritual traditions, this is a big theme in spiritual traditions, right? Uh, you know, St. Paul in the Christian tradition says, death, where is thy sting, right? Uh, that there is a love greater than death um, or reincarnation or, you know, uh, so um, this was even practiced by Neanderthal, a species that died out. Uh, so the idea of God emerged from a belief in spirits, which in turn uh, derived from a belief that ancestors or loved ones would not just die, but would continue to exist in some way. Um, and uh, this is all summarized in a book by uh, Eugen Drevermann. You have the uh, book here. It's on, unfortunately only in German. Uh, I have translated some parts in one of my books that I will show you now. You also see fertility cults were also associated with love, of course. Um, and, and the sense of something bigger, something more powerful than uh, what is just here. Um, now, I want to fast forward to very interesting developments in mother-infant research here in the United States. Uh, Daniel Stern, many of you may know this book, uh, The Interpersonal World of the Infant. Uh, this was a bestseller, and it basically talks about uh, what the humanists in many respects knew, what Carl Rogers knew, is that we become persons by being related to as persons, as respected persons, as valuable persons, as people who matter. That's how we become persons. And... <clears throat> Uh, in 2017, the uh, Psychoanalytic Associations basically brought out this psychodynamic diagnostic manual uh, that tries to understand who we are as persons. It's an alternative manual to the DSM. The DSM is a pathology manual. It's a psychiatric manual. It's only created to help you find the right medication. It has no definition of mental health. The psychodynamic diagnostic manual says you cannot just say that people are depressed or obsessive or narcissistic and create all these symptom clusters, but never understand who people would be if they're healthy. There's no baseline for that in the DSM. And so the psychodynamic diagnostic manual comes out of a long tradition of character analysis. Um, and it basically uh, says that uh, any understanding of mental health issues must begin with the concept of healthy psychology. Mental health is more than simply the absence of symptoms. And so they have developed a very useful tool uh, for uh, understanding different types of personality patterns. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up here is because I believe that spirituality comes in different flavors. And when there are personality, when there are issues of spirituality in counseling, we need to know what kind of person this person is, what kind of personality style they have. Um, and uh, there is in the counseling world, world a model that uh, is kind of similar uh, by the Ivies. Uh, you're maybe familiar with the Ivies, uh, their developmental uh, counseling and therapy model. I gave a presentation at ACES. Uh, where, where uh, they were actually there uh, on the psychodynamic diagnostic manual. And there is nice overlap here. And I want to 
emphasize this year uh, that uh, DCT starts with the assumption that all personality styles, so they're talking about personality styles, not disorders, represent logical adaptive functioning. Each developmental personality disorder or style has healthy dimensions. They're making a similar argument to the psychodynamic diagnostic manual. Um, and the psychodynamic diagnostic manual doesn't start with symptoms. It, uh, it helps people also put symptoms in perspective. So it, it goes through all the symptom patterns that the DSM has. Uh, what it also nicely does, it says, okay, we have a section for uh, infants, we have a section for children, we have a section for young adults, we have a section for adults, and we have a section for uh, the uh, people in advanced age because they have all different developmental needs, sort of like what Erickson was teaching us, right? It's a fascinating manual. Uh, but what they say is we first need to understand the personality structure. So we first need to understand what kind of personality style are we working with. Then you go into capacities of mental health functioning. So capacity of mental functioning, that comes out of those of you who are familiar with ego psychology, which was big in the social work world, also in counseling, I think. Uh, ego psychology basically talked about ego functions, like judgment and impulse control, all of that. All of that. And recently, a lot of this has been uh, operationalized in terms of mental functioning. And the PDM creates an assessment tool to assess 12 discrete mental functioning errors that come in four clusters. Uh, and then from there you say, okay, let's understand the meaning of symptoms. You want to understand the meaning of symptoms and not just random. I mean, I just dream of what would happen if we applied this to people that are incarcerated. If we applied this to children, try to understand who is this person in school, right? Uh, what are they trying to solve here? Right? What are they trying to express? What healthy capacities are going the wrong direction? Right? So what I teach my students is I help my students to identify the strength in capacities because in these 12 areas, they're always strength. And then to find out how they can use these strength to help work on the ones that are weak, that are not well developed. Um, and so uh, the personality starts to go first to that are relatively stable ways of thinking, feeling, behaving, and relating to others. So cognitive, affective, defensive, relational. And then personality is more that about who one is than about what disorder one has. And the focus, focus and that's why I like the, uh, the, uh, the PDM, is, is on mental wellness. It's on mental health. Uh, uh, and it was helping a person be who they are in the context they live in. Now, this is, a, this is an assessment chart. It's called personality patterns or disorders. Uh, this is one of the sections where you can assess. The chart is called the PDC. It was created by Gord, Robert Gordon and others. Uh, and this is basically the tool where you help. Uh, this is one of the tools where you can help assess the level of personality functioning, like how healthy is the functioning in terms of the development, right? And so it's it's done from one to five, and five would be healthy, right? And there are there are keys basically in the psychodynamic diagnostic manual. The overarching criterion they have is for the more rigid you are around certain capacities, the less healthy it is. The more flexibility you have, the better. It reminded me of, uh, you know, in my psychoanalytic institute in New York, it was NPAP. Uh, well, one of my professors who talked about perversions, he said, if you have all of them, you're just a healthy person, right? If you have all perversions, if you do everything. That was uh, something that I uh, thought might be funny here. Um, now, it's good, good, good. It's okay to chuckle, but when we talk about perversion, it's sort of like, should you show that you chuckle or not, right? No, <laughs> right, right, right. So, so now one of the things you need to know is personality patterns uh, can are, are basically on a continuum. Healthy, neurotic, borderline, and psychotic. 
So the way the PDM uses borderline is not, okay, you are a borderline person, right? Instead, what they say is all of these personality styles can come in a borderline range where you are either more or less in touch with reality, where you're more or less splitting into absolute good and absolute evil, things like that. Uh, here, here are the, I'm only gonna show that to you and you can look that up on your slides. Uh, in the interest of time, I wanna keep going. And here's one of the rating scales, like one of the capacities is, so individuals, the capacity for differentiation and degradation. Uh, individuals, uh, a five would be individuals at this level can appreciate the separateness and relatedness of different affect states, motives and wishes of self and others, even when these are nuanced and ambiguous and can organize experience and social emotional demands. Uh, and so on, they can interact with an increasingly complex and demanding environment while using defenses and coping resources with adequate stability, flexibility, and spontaneity. So it doesn't have to be perfect, to adequate, right? And then you see here uh, a three would be at this level can different integrate experience, but with some constriction or oversimplification, especially under stress. Right, so, so, and then you go to a one that is much more compromised. And so you basically assess people. I'm not doing a presentation on the PDM, so I wanna go uh, further, but I wanna say this is in the background of it. So uh, now this is psychology. So far I've talked about psychology, I've talked about history, um, but what is spirit? We lack a good definition of spirit. I talked about life and death issues, about finitude and so on. And here I wanna introduce you to you, uh, this man, Eugen Drebermann, you probably would say in, in English, Eugene Drebermann, uh, but uh, his name is Eugen Drebermann. Uh, and uh, unfortunately he has a name that's hard to pronounce. I wish it was better to pronounce, but I have done a lot of work on his work. And he combined psychodynamic uh, and existential uh, things. He also was trained in Rogerian stuff and so on, and he is in neuropsychology and all kinds of things. So, but what he says that spirit uh, is about self-organizing dynamics at the heart of all levels. That's where self uh, spirit starts. It starts really in biology. Biology is all based on self-organizing processes. Life is based on self-organizing processes. We have to appreciate that self-organizing processes are the basis of life. And spirit has to do with these self-organizing processes are happening in our mind. There's a self-organizing process. Uh, somebody who has done work on this in neurology is Gerald Edelman, he's a Nobel prize uh, winning neurologist. And he basically defined spirit as consciousness mirroring itself. So as you're listening to me, you may be aware of another part of you. You may be aware of, okay, how is he presenting? You have a reaction to me. You have a subjective experience, right? That's your inner self having a relationship to you, to the environment that's self-organizing process. If you decide it's okay, I'm gonna stay awake. If you decide this is too much, I'm gonna fall asleep, right? Your self-organizing process is working, right? <laughs> um, so so uh, Edelman basically looked at how uh, in our mind, in our brain actually, uh, there are, is one neural map that mirrors another neuronal map. He called that re-entrant processes. And so, so you have feedback loops. The existentialists would have loved this because they were all concerned about, you know, I think that I think that I think that I think. Can you try that? You think that you think that you think that you think, right? And this to make matters worse, you don't just think that you think that you think. I think that I think while I think about you and you think about me and you think about thinking that I'm thinking me, right? And so I'm, right? What? I'm just gonna nap. 
You got a map now. Okay, good. Okay, okay, good. I got you all awake here. So, so, so to illustrate this, um, this is basically what our spirit looks like. Our spirit is like when you step into these into uh, an elevator in your hotel and there are two opposing mirrors. How many times do you see yourself? Infinite. If you are exactly uh, facing each other, infinite, but you can't because you only have eyes in one side, right? So you can't. And you would be in your own way, right? So, so but infinite. This is what I suggest is the origin is it's the the con to get philosophical here it's the condition for the very possibility of us thinking of infinity without our spirit being self-reflective we could never even imagine the infinite we could never even conceive of the divine now this is a game changer this changes everything this is what's involved in what CBT calls catastrophizing. Catastrophizing is not just the symptom. <clears throat> catastrophizing is, I am afraid this is everything. This is gonna kill me. I'm never ever gonna matter. When, whenever you, this is what I wanna suggest to you, whenever people talk in therapy about never, ever, always, uh, can't ever happen, um these are spiritual terms it doesn't matter at all whether I'm, anybody uses god language or not this has to do always with spirituality so depression i'm absolutely worthless is basically infinitizing worthlessness or to be more precise infinitizing the fear of worthlessness so when you look at this, spirit can infinitize either our awareness of death leading to despair. It can infinitize finitude, basically. Or spirit can infinitize our awareness of aliveness leading to trust. These two are just given. Now, what decides whether we experience the infinite, the spirit capacity, has to do with fear. The alternative of fear versus trust as a tool to distinguish between healthy and unhealthy uses of religion, of religious coping, of spirituality. And what I mean with fear here or trust is not just, okay, a car is going to hit me, not an object fear. It's the existential fear. Do I matter? Do I not matter? Do you treat me in a way that I feel like I matter? If you don't treat me like that, then my existential fear gets ramped up, whether I consciously feel that or not. In a schizoid personality pattern, to go a little ahead of myself, people don't necessarily feel the fear consciously. The fear is basically the whole person. It's a character armor. It's petrified fear. Or reason is completely invested with sorting out all kinds of fears without effectively feeling it. But reason is an instrumentarium at that time of fear. The Frankfurt School of, of Sociology, I, I studied sociology as well, uh, talked about reason becoming mad with itself. Max Horkheimer talked about this. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we have postmodernism. You, know? you can be so hyper-rational and it just creates oppression, right? Now, I have described a lot of what I'm talking about here in a book that I wrote, uh, A Violent God Image. And I'm in introducing Draverman's analysis. He goes through theology really and, and tries to help us uh really debunk theology that is based on fear and boy folks i'm living in indiana there is so much fear going around in the name of religion just like in so many other states they're passing laws left and right to control the other which is all based on their own fears but it has a social dimension 
And religious texts are used to instill fear, to control people, the law, so to speak, of the, the letter of the law. Now, here is a brief view of this assessment tool. I just want to show that to you at this point. I'm going to go a little bit deeper into it. Uh, uh, and it shows you the four main personality types. Now, what you see here is that uh, on top, like the second, the, the second box really, uh, no, the third one is depressive personality, schizo personality, obsessive compulsive personality, histrionic or hysterical personality. These are not necessarily pathologies. So when you think of yourself as a personality, right? Let's see, each of us sees an accident, right? One of you will feel more quickly sad. One of you feel more quickly angry. One of you feel more quickly cut off. And one of you may quickly hyperventilate. Which of these do you think is associated to which? The sad one would be what? Depressive. The angry one would be? The cutoff one would be the cutoff one more. Or the hyperventilating one. Histrionic. Yes, hyperventilating, histrionic, right? Yes, more schizoid, right? And then angry is more the obsessive compulsive type. Now, this is not always the case, of course. Everyone has all feelings, <laughs> right? But this is about typically, in real, you, you have a natural inclination toward that, right? Or feeling more guilty, or feel, you know, so some one feels more guilty easily, the other blames more easily. The other like, oh, you know, what should I do? You're gonna help me, you're gonna save me, right? So these are personality styles. They can come out in healthy ways, but under stress, we show kind of our flavors, right? Now, uh, this is an assessment tool that you can use to understand the spiritual dimensions of your clients. I have the whole sheet, it's two, two sheets uh, on this QR code. I'll show this to you at the end again, but uh, in the interest of time, let's go further. I, this is, I, I really just made this up, uh, but I, I tried to say, maybe there is a correlation to the Myers-Briggs somewhere. Uh, and I'm not absolutely sure, but I think, you know, the analysts might be more in the schizoid range. Uh, the diplomates are more in the depressive range. The sentinels, uh, the judging ones are more in the obsessive compulsive and the explorers are more in the, you know, we will explore all the possibilities, right? Because you will see here that uh, as we go into this and just to, as I go into the, the final part of the presentation here, um, understanding the psychological dimensions of spirituality. I do that through um, focusing on God images. And when I start, talk about God image, I don't mean like a picture of God, you know, we clearly distinguish between pictures of God and God image. When I talk about God image, I talk about anything that has to do with infinitizing, with infinity, with, with that. It can be existential, it can be just spiritual, it can be atheist, it doesn't matter. It's a God image. Anna, you know, uh, Anna Maria Rusuto told us everyone has God images. And so I'm kind of uh, coming out of that tradition. So what you have to understand is that there is the self-reflective consciousness, then there is a personality style that is relational. And the third thing that I haven't mentioned yet are, where are the images coming from that we uh, uh, basically put people into our own categories. Dreams, of course, are the origin, like is a deep treasure of images. And so Jungian psychology, uh, but even Freudian psychology on some level, uh, uh, you know, is reliant on the idea of dream images. Uh, uh, humanists can work with uh, dreams and so on. Um, there are image creating, there's an image creating layer in our psyche that is evolutionarily based that is much older than the personal, the per sense of personhood, much older. It's much older than even the self-reflective consciousness. And that basically gives the flesh to the bones of our spirituality. It's poetry. 
Now, what happens often in, in what I call bad religion is that these are literalized. They're basically squeezed into consciousness as if this is just consciousness. And of course, it was the divine that brought the, the idea. It just dropped the, uh, dropped the ideas down, dropped the images down, right? So Christ is boom, right? <laughs> or, uh, you know, all of these images in religions are coming from our psyche. Now, the reason why this is so, so important is no organization. And this is something that I think uh, will resonate with, with uh, people who are saying they're spiritual and not religious. No organization holds the trademark on religious imagery. It comes from within. It comes from inside. That's the beauty of Jungian psychology. But it is it it becomes, uh, I'll have that in a moment. So I have a slide here from Anna Maria Rusuto. She said, if a child feels that mirroring experience was not sufficient, an, or a child early, you know, we had Lisa Miller here yesterday from Columbia University. Uh, Beatrice Beebe, anyone have heard of Beatrice Beebe? She has done work at Columbia University uh, of mother infant research, moment by moment video recording. Her last name is B-E-E-B-E. -E -B -E. Uh, and has done fascinating work of how infants are not just reacting to mothers or uh, fathers. They are co-creating the relationship. They have their unique character early on. And so, but an infant needs to be mirrored. If an infant isn't mirrored, then we know the, the, the sad research of Rene Spitz with the orphans, orphans that are only fed and not related to, half of them died in these orphanages. If you're not related to as a person, you crumble and shrivel. So we need the I and thou in, in Martin Buber's terms. Now, if we are not mirrored, then something happens to our spirit. Then we start misrelating to ourselves. And this is, I told you, I'm going to go through a tour de force here. This is when we're going to go into the nitty gritty of how these personality styles come. But first here, the images that come from within, and this is where I disagree with Jung. I don't think they have just a natural progression toward good. And I, I, I grew up in Germany uh, and with a history of Nazi Germany and I'm Turkish German. So, uh, you know, very complex background, uh, but these, images that came up during Nazi Germany, you know, going into the Valhalla, these were archetypal images. When they're not grounded in a relational trusting dynamic that, em that empowers an individual person, then the individual person cannot say no to the rulers. So we need to strengthen persons so that they can say no to the oppressive dynamics out there, because the oppressive dynamics out there also are using these archetypal imagery. They're talking about the devil. They're talking about all kinds of things, right? Heaven and hell. It's all in there. Um, so the archetypal images evoke either positive or negative effects, depending on whether a person's ego experiences these images in relation to another person within an atmosphere of trust or fear. Okay, now let's go to the spirit, right? I told you about the spirit is self-relational. This was, this idea comes from Søren Kierkegaard, who was a father of existentialism, right? And Kierkegaard basically said that our, um, uh, our spirit is made up of four dimensions or four poles. Uh, one is finitude, we know we're dying. One is a longing for the infinite. We're more than finitude. Uh, one is possibility. We have all kinds of possibility. One is necessity. So that freedom is not just possibility, it's easily illustrated. You know, if you want to go on a vacation, you need money, you may need a car, you may need a, a flight. All of these are based on natural laws, which are necessities. So you need necessities to make possibilities real. You need the finite to anchor the infinite. 
Now, where spiritual problems happen if, is if we're afraid and we become despairing, we hang ourselves on one of these poles of existence. That is a particular form of despair. And so uh, this is in uh, Duran's book on uh, psychoanalysis and moral theology. But so then what happens if we hang ourselves on one uh, pole, then it leads to a misrelation of the self. Then we experience uh, nothingness because we're really not uh, whole ourselves. And also we become afraid of freedom, which is in the middle. Remember that first slide that I showed you? Freedom is in the middle. It's when we are kind of in the center of these four. That's where freedom lies. And so the terrible thing is, as the existentialist told us, we are actually afraid of freedom. We're not afraid of the freedom from like many people want to free from somebody, as Eric Fromm told us. But we're afraid of the freedom too. So now I'm free. Now what? What am I going to do now with all this time, right? <laughs> I have limited resources. So, you know, whatever. Uh, so it sets one of the four poles as absolute, which is not absolute. That's a big spiritual problem. Uh, the way I use God images to assess the harm of spirit, held or harm of spirituality is I look at uh, how uh, fear is infinitized in terms of one of these poles. And a violent God image, uh, again, not God picture, is the result of the human spirit's misrelation to itself due to despair. A healthy nonviolent God image is the result of the infinitization of existential trust. A healthy nonviolent God image is the result of the human spirit's balanced relation to itself due to trust. So my thesis is now I'm a psychoanalyst as well, and I work psychodynamically. And in psychoanalysis, we work with transference. Basically, we say, you know, the templates that were created early on when you grew up, whoever your primary caregivers were, you developed certain styles of relating, right? They're all automatic. And so when you come into the room in the counseling room, you're going to experience that with me. And so what psychoanalysis does and psychodynamic work does, it is says, we're not just saying, oh, we're going to try to minimize that as much. We are recognizing how that works. And we find out how I um, put in those templates. That's transference. So if the client thinks I'm angry, but I'm really not angry. I'm not going to say to them, well, I'm not angry. I'm curious, you know, what, what happened when you thought I was angry? I'm trying to explore that, right? That's psychodynamic work. And so in terms of spirituality, what I suggest is we need to understand how people put these absolute forms of despair onto us, but also have absolute longings for trust. We need to work with that. The, yes. Can you describe a violent image of God? I will in a patient. Yes, I will in a patient. I have a patient coming up. Yes. So, so uh, I'm almost done with these slides, and then I'll bring you a patient. So, uh, and I say patient not because I think I'm a big doctor. Or so I say patient because it's a thank you. Uh, I'm saying that because I think of the word suffering. The word patient originally comes from. Uh, pathos, uh, you know, that's where it comes from. I don't, people come typically to us because they're suffer. They don't want just some tune up or they want to be fixed like neural machines. They want to be understood, right? And help us help them deal with their suffering. So anyway, uh, so there can be a despair finitude, which means you hang yourself on the schizoid pole, on the finitude pole. You exclude uh, infinity from your mind. It's all just rational, right? These are often very concrete people. Uh, or you hang yourself on the pole of infinity, despair of infinity. I'm guilty for everything. You know, an accident happened, that's probably because of me. Or, you know, I'm showing up late to the session as a, as a therapist, and then, oh, you know, uh, uh, I sh you know, it was probably my fault I didn't tell you that blah, 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 right? Or you're good. I'm sorry that, uh, you know, you had to deal with me today. 
That's like taking responsibility for me when it was really my issue. Infinite amounts of possibility, uh, responsibility. Now, there is despair and then there are, wh when it gets to uh, more neurotic forms of, of the, the personality styles, right? When there's uh, pain, it can go into schizoid disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, hysteria or histrionic disorder and depression. Now, what's interesting is Straverman argues that this is actually even related to paleoanthropological fears. So these are not just fell from the sky, all of a sudden we have schizoid, depressive, whatever, but these are based in evolution, these dynamics. So there is a hypochondriacal fear and fear of impoverishment that's related to schizoid, a fear of being trapped that's related to, and these animals experience this, other animals, uh, to uh, obsessive compulsive dynamic and necessity, a uh, fear of loneliness or loss of love, a fear of hunger and impoverishment. Um, so all forms of despair uh, are uh, of clinging to one pole of existence lead to the desperate liquidation of a real life. Now you see that you as a counselor have to be very real to deal with that. You cannot hide behind your role. You have to be real to deal with unreality. Uh, it brings gain of illness. Often people have, and this is where the symptom perspective is helpful, symptoms are attempts at solutions. That's what symptoms are. But they didn't go well. Um, only a temporary uh, reduction of anxiety. Um, here is, uh, this is from the PDM, and so I want to uh, um, go to the characteristic pathogenic belief about self when it gets problematic. There's something essentially bad or inadequate about me. Someone or something necessary for well-being has been uh, irretrievably lost. And on the sheet, uh, you see the, the, the column with depressive. There's the fear of loss of object, the fear of loss of love. You know, Freud thought that uh, depression and mourning, like, Grief is related somehow, but in grief, you're really knowing you lost somebody outside. In mourning, you feel like you lost part of yourself when you lost them. Um, so here are some characteristics. I use the example of depression. Fears finitude and despairs of infinity. It avoids the acceptance of limitations. The patient I'm going to talk about is she was everyone to uh, everything to everyone. Never any needs herself. Um, he identified the sheer infinite and boundless feelings of guilt, responsibility paired with an unlimited readiness to be there for others. Basically, the person tries to act like God without getting all the perks. <laughs> That's what severe depression is. Uh, a differential from obsessive compulsive is in obsessive compulsive, the person doesn't feel guilty for who they are, they feel guilty for bad actions. It's focused on actions. Um, the depressive person flees, uh, again, if it's more in the, in the unhealthy direction, into others. Mm -hmm. Others have absolute rights, fear to be experienced as a burden, but at the same time, wanting everything from the other person, but hiding them. Uh, self needs to be like God, omni-responsible, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. That's often what a depressive folks present to with us. Uh, everything is her fault. Self is utterly worthy, unworthy before God or, P or the group or the superior. Turns God into a principle of light from the world. So, so if there is a God, uh, explicit God image, the person may pray and God take this away from me and so on doesn't let the person live in the world. They don't feel a lot of pleasure in finite, finitude. Culturally, the religion often feeds into masochistic guilt feelings. Religion is reduced to morality and fosters a follower mentality, which is very dangerous. Um, and the God transference may be the field self to be absolutely responsible for everything in treatment. See, says uh, he expects nothing, but in reality expects God like his presence of therapist. Fears spiritually integrated counselor is absolute moralist. So you could be the absolute moralist. Healing comes through developing trust, learning to trust that she is absolutely wanted and accepted in her very finitude. 
uh, shortcomings and limitations. The article that I have is called On Being Wanted to Exist. And I'm presenting this case of Rosa there. She really uh, lifts this out uh, of uh, wanting to be accepted. And really, the treatment uh, went somewhere when she felt like I really wanted her to exist for herself. She often had been wanted, like abused and so on, but for herself, not for me. Um, so this is uh, the case. I see it. We have like a few minutes. I, I'll just put this up here. Uh, she, um, Rosa, just in a minute here, she suffered from severe depression, uh, severe suicidality. She was separated from her husband, but her husband would go in and out of her house, uh, force her to have sex, basically raped her. She couldn't close the door. She couldn't say no to him. Um, and she would, uh, I was an intern at the time, actually, this was one of my trial by fire, you know, um, and she, my supervisor told me she needs to be having access to me if she's in a crisis. So she would sometimes call me and she would be on the phone and say, I'm going to, I have the pills here. I'm going to kill myself. I would say, you have to call the hospital. I'm not going to call the hospital. Well, I could call the hospital, but she said, I'm not going to do anything. She needed me to walk her through. So what you see is here on that sheet, you see that there's an oral preoccupation often with going with depressive dynamics. I don't think of this really in terms of drive, like as Freud thought, like inner drives or whatever, but just the personality style. And I believe that personality styles also affect how we experience our body. Um, and so uh, she felt like nothing. Uh, she felt infinite guilt feelings. She, uh, I had absolute rights, you know, if I wanted to change anything, the people she worked for had absolute rights. Um, she felt guilty for taking up space. She wanted to disappear. She wanted to disappear. And that was the way she talked about suicide. So let me open it up uh, if you have any questions or comments. I know it's a lot to present, uh, but I wanted to get into the depth and also into the granular here. So the guy image, is that your, your idea of an image of God being evil or? Well, you know, that goes into moral uh, dynamics. See, this is beyond moral, really. It's, it's yeah, like I... Is it, is, it, is it a description of what the person feels about how God is? Yes, they, yes, 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 that, that God devalues her. But see that... not a, a specific image. No, no, but here's, here, here's what happened when she, when she got better. She, she experienced abuse from priests. And this is what she said at some point to me toward the end of our work. And I was taken aback when she said this. I feel I can trust you. You are, are like God, the good God of my childhood, the one my grandmother quietly taught me, as opposed to the one of the priests who covered up those who abused me and my family. She was very clearly clear that I'm not God, but she associated me with a safe object, her grandmother, who wanted her in her own right, who didn't want anything from her. See, she remember, she had con she had a good God image, a God image that let her live, that valued her as a being, that came out. She had never thought of this before. This came out at the end. In terms of images, she often had a recurring dream. She would run toward this, the, the ocean, or, or toward actually a bridge, and her father would uh, be in a crowd behind her and she would get to the bridge and the bridge would break up in the middle over the river. The progression of our treatment worked with her slowly having this dream change. By the very end, she jumped into the water she swam to the other side and there were other people that helped her. Now, if you again think of spirituality, you know, I know in the Christian tradition, we have the stories about stilling of the storm. And in one of those stories, Jesus comes from the other shore. 
basically she is talking about that she she experienced me as a good person who's not going to drown her who's not going to cut off a way out for her but where she could gain her own power her own strength to be able to swim get to the other side that was the kind of god image that basically developed this all happened without her ever mentioning the image of the word god it's not about the words god it's about the experience of having a sense of ultimate trust. So that that's an example, right? Any questions? I know it's a lot. If you have any questions, you can uh, you can uh, you know there are some book publications by. From me, I have a violent God image. That book is out. I'm working right now on the second book, with, which I published in German. It's also in Dutch. Uh, God ohne Angst, which would be translated God without fear. In Dutch, it was God without uh, fear and uh, violence. And um, I'm working on it in English. I am almost done with the translation. I was on a sabbatical. Uh, and it should be God without delusion. Some of you who know Richard Dawkins' his book, The God Delusion. Uh, I engaged that in two chapters, his critique of God in terms of science. I, I engaged that. Um, and so God Without Delusion is the title that I would like to have. I'm almost done translating that. And then I also have a number of uh, articles that I've written that you can see on the slides. Um, uh, and uh, some of my uh, here, this is the article that I refer to that you have uh, in your QR code. Here are some other sources that I give. And here's the QR code again for you. All right, thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you.